The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Is that twinkling in the night sky a star, a satellite, or something more mysterious? For eons, and especially in popular culture, the notion of aliens and unidentified flying objects has been, well, out there. Tonight, we'll assess emerging information from credible military sources to separate science from science fiction. And back here for a more earthly and familiar form of transportation, we speak to author Marcello Di Cintio about his book profiling the fascinating backstories of taxi drivers. It's Wednesday, June 16th, and that's next on The Agenda. Later this month, the United States Department of Defense is set to release a trove of documents. They pertain to what might be the most obsessively discussed and imagined topic they've ever investigated. Unexplained aerial phenomena, or as we usually say, UFOs. Canadian Air Force pilots have also reported sightings, and if serious people are now finally talking about this, well then, so are we. To do that, let's welcome, in Pasadena, California, Amy Shira Title, spaceflight historian and author of Fighting for Space, Two Pilots and Their Historic Battle for Female Spaceflight. On Manhattan Island in New York City, Ralph Blumenthal. He was a reporter with the New York Times for more than four decades and is author of The Believer, Alien Encounters, Hard Science, and the Passion of John Mack. In Winnipeg, Manitoba, Chris Rutkowski, a science writer who runs the blog Ufology Research. And in the annex neighborhood of Ontario's capital city, there's Daniel Otis, freelance journalist who has written for publications such as Vice, the Toronto Star, and the Globe and Mail. And we're delighted to welcome all four of you onto TVO's airwaves tonight. And, uh, okay, Chris, first question, what's that little thing over your right shoulder? We're a serious show here. What's, what is that thing? <laughs> well, that, of course, is the Reddit alien that everybody knows is uh, called Snoo, as in what's Snoo with you? It's one of those things where, where people are always, uh, they want to get me something because of my UFO interest for Father's Day or birthdays or whatever. So it's always something, whether it's Marvin or, or anything like that. I gotcha. Okay. Ralph, I'd like to start with you, if I could, because it was your piece, I guess, in the New York Times about three and a half years ago that essentially broke the story that the Pentagon was investigating unidentified flying objects, as they were then called. Uh, all right. Refresh our memories. What did you find out back then? Well, we found out there was a secret uh, uh, unit in the Pentagon called the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, ATIP, um, that uh, was funded starting in 2007 with $22 million, which is a drop in the bucket in the Pentagon budget, uh, to research uh, these unexplained encounters that maybe pilots and sailors were having with objects. Um, and um, we found out, we at the New York Times, I and two colleagues found out that um, uh, this unit had been studying this phenomenon for a number of years uh, with no disclosure to the American public. Supposedly, the government was out of the UFO business with Project Blue Book at the end of 1969, but in reality, they were continuing to investigate, and that's what we reported. These uh, three and a half years later, are you able to say how you got that scoop now? Um, yeah, I mean, one of my colleagues, Leslie Kane, who's a noted UFO writer, got a tip that a meeting was going on in Washington, D.C. with the head of the program, uh, Luis Elizondo, um, who was resigning because he was not getting enough support from the government. And uh, he, his was not a household name then. It is now, of course. But um, uh, Leslie went down, sat in on the meeting, came back to me. And um, I reported, I was a contrib then a contributor to the New York Times, having left the regular reporting staff. I reported to the executive editor that we had a real scoop about the secret uh, Pentagon office investigating UFOs. And uh, we had it all, you know, chapter and verse, uh, on the record, no, you know, anonymous sources. We had the documentation. We had uh, Alessandro's resignation letter. And they put it on the front page on a Sunday. And uh, as they say, the rest is history. Indeed. One more quick follow-up on this. And that is, you said it was a $22 million program. I think the Pentagon's budget back then was something like $600 billion. So what did that tell you about what kind of commitment the Pentagon was actually making to this? Uh, that, all you need to know, it was, a, it was really a drop in the bucket. It was a very minor commitment. Um, 
And they claim they shut down the program five years later, but we know it continued in another form and continues to this day. So they were not, you know, bannering it, uh, but they were continuing. Okay, with that background in place, let's now show everybody, uh, you guys and our viewers, uh, this was some video that the Pentagon released back in 2004. It's supposed to be an encounter between a fighter jet and let's just call it an unknown object. Okay, Sheldon, if you would, let's roll that. Oh my God. We're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 miles to the west. Oh, I think, dude. That's not our LNS though, is it? It's not. That is our LNS, dude. Well, if there's like Look at thing, it's rotating. So that's video from 2004, released in 2017. And Amy, let's go to you first on this. When you saw that, what'd you think? I thought it was pretty interesting. Um and very, very blurry. Um, the thing that really stands out to me in those videos, all of these Navy videos, is that they are seen in radars, which immediately, I mean, I am the self-described skeptic, immediately makes me wonder if it couldn't be some kind of artifact. Um, but still, nevertheless, I think it's really interesting, and I'm the one who loves to kind of take what looks unexplained and try to find the explanation. So my, my immediate thought is, this is neat. Let's look at how artifacts and radar might work. Let's try to, you know, we obviously don't know all the details. We can't know all the details, but that's kind of where my mind goes first. Daniel, where does your mind go first? Well, you know, I'm not an aeronautical engineer, and it's difficult for me to speak about the performance capabilities we're seeing there. But really, uh, what really interests me with these videos is the audio, the voices. You know, these are trained military aviators uh, who have a pretty good idea of the things that should be in the sky, and they're expressing, you know, shock, excitement, surprise um, at, their, at what they're seeing. And to me, that reaction uh, really highlights the anomalous nature of what's depicted in these videos. Chris, how about your reaction? Well, I, uh, when I saw it, I, I realized that there's something very strange going on here, but we have to parse out what the, the, not only what the audio was saying, but also the uh, descriptions of the objects by the pilots themselves later, and they, they don't match what we see in the video. In fact, one of the problems with the videos is that uh, we don't have all the information. We don't, uh, a lot of it has been stripped of some of its uh, uh, accompanying information as to uh, when it was taken, where it was taken, so forth. And the video itself it was actually kicking around on uh, the internet uh, years before the Pentagon released it. So there's a lot of red flags that are there. But at the same time, I agree with, with Amy that it is very curious and I, I want to know more. Ralph, I suppose there's the inclination to want to jump to the conclusion that it is an unidentified flying object. But is it just as equally possible that it could be some who knows what military thing from Russia or China or beyond? Well, the experts that we've consulted at the New York Times have pretty much ruled that out. First of all, it's not ours, because we wouldn't be, uh, you know, endangering our own pilots by running these things in, in our own airspace where pilots are going around. Uh, equally unlikely is that it's Russian or Chinese, because we don't think, or our best experts don't think, that they have uh, graduated to that level. Astonishing aerodynamics, uh, invisibility, ability to operate in the water, by the way, under underwater as well as the air. Um, so I would say, uh, yeah, you know, we're all skeptical, but on the other hand, um, uh, catching these things on radar, uh, on uh, thermal imaging cameras, being eyeballed by our most highly trained observers, these pilots, um, really leads to the conclusion that for the first time, uh, we can say, or experts can say with some authority that these things exist uh, physically. They don't know, you know what they are, where they come from, who's behind the wheel. They don't know anything about them. But the big breakthrough, in my view, is that they now know, more or less, uh, convincingly, that they exist, which they couldn't say before. They attribute it to swamp gas or reflections on the desert floor from headlights or hallucinations of fly specks on the windshield, you know, you name it. But now it looks like these things really exist. So that is, uh, that's something. Chris, you've been studying UFOs for how long? Uh, for, well, uh, let's say 40 years and, and go from there. Okay. In your four decades plus of looking at these things and studying these things, how common would what we just saw be in the Canadian skies? Well, in Canada, there are more than 1,000 reports uh, that are recorded every year. Uh, the Canadian UFO survey that I uh, coordinate 
uh, has about 22,000 cases over the past 30 years or so. And we do get reports from pilots. We get reports from um, military personnel, from air, uh, um, uh, from uh, you know people in towers. Uh, it, it, they're all over the map. And most of the cases can be explained, but there's a small fraction every year that are puzzling. And uh, a lot of them do come from pilots who are reporting things similar to what uh, uh, has been reported in the United States. And Amy, we should just say you're, you're originally from Canada. You're in California right now. How many of these things, as Chris just described them, would you say are genuinely, truly unexplainable? Not that many, to be honest. Um, you see a lot. I'm... I'm in LA and we see a lot of unexplained phenomena in the sky. I get a lot of texts from friends panicking about weird things and pretty much I look up what just launched out of Vandenberg and it's usually you're seeing a rocket contrail or you're seeing a rocket stage go over. Um, I think most of the time and granted I'm not the UFOlogist, but most of the time when I look into things that are unexplained, they're typically explained, they're either debris from rockets. They're aircraft that we just don't, we aren't familiar with, so we're not used to seeing the shape of, so they're just aircraft. A lot of people um, mistake just, uh, you know, upper atmospheric lightning. It's something that we don't see very often. That can be uh, interpreted as a UFO. Um, not to mention, apparently, people see planets <laughs> and think they're UFOs sometimes because they're not used to the light from planets not wavering. Hmm. All right, Daniel, we talked about the, uh, the U.S. Pentagon and its interest in this going back in time. How about the Canadian military? What do we know about their interest in sightings of UFOs? Um, well, my understanding is that their interest is almost non-existent. Um, the Canadian military and military personnel have been reporting things of this nature for close to 70 years. And these are at bases from coast to coast. Um, you know, one example would be at CFB North Bay in northeastern Ontario. There were UFO reports filed by military personnel in both 2007 and in 1952. And the case in 1952 was, you know, genuinely the weirder one. It involved a fast moving light that stopped and then reversed and sped away faster than anything the witnesses had ever seen. And these were uh, Canadian Air Force personnel. So there's been uh, a history of documentation in Canada regarding this, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of follow-up and investigation on the part of the military. They're getting these reports, but they don't really seem to be doing much with them. Chris, is that your understanding as well? Uh, absolutely. In fact, uh, what's curious is that uh, in Canada, we actually have a more transparent uh, uh, military interest in UFOs, despite the fact that, as Daniel says, it doesn't seem to be they're doing much. The United States uh, finished its Project Blue Book that many people are familiar with from the TV shows and so forth uh, back in the 1960s. And since then, there hadn't been very much information about what the United States has been doing in terms of UFO reports and investigations and, and sightings uh, until uh, the recent Pentagon interest in uh, the videos. So it, I think it's because of that that we have the interest. But in Canada, we know the National Research Council investigated UFOs in partnership with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police until about 1995. After that, Transport Canada took a role. The RCAF has been involved. But it seems like it's been a hot potato. And I think that's, uh, that, that's the biggest concern is that nobody seems to know what to do with the UFO phenomenon. Chris, let me do a quick follow-up with you on that. Do you think... I mean, we're living in a COVID-19 age right now, and, and, you know, people are reacting some well, some not so well. Do you think COVID has had an influence in the spiking of people noticing UFOs? Well, in fact, uh, in 2020, uh, sorry, in, in 2019, we did notice uh, an increase in the number of UFO reports. In, in 2020, we noticed a, a significant increase in the number of UFO reports. Uh, and a lot of uh, speculation has been around whether this was regarding the pandemic. People were spending more more time at home in their backyards rather than inside venues where they didn't look into the sky and hence reporting UFOs. However, we're still in the midst of the pandemic. And in 2021 so far, the number of UFOs in Canada, actually also in the United States, has decreased quite significantly. So uh, there's other factors at play, but there's certainly a, a re relationship there somehow. Amy, can I get you to weigh in on that as well? Has COVID-19 contributed to this in any way? I mean, possibly. <laughs> it's possible that, um, and I think that it might have contributed more, not 
from what I see at least, not necessarily in sightings or people kind of seeing things, but in the interest in this, I think we're so just bogged down with COVID coverage and there's so much negativity in the news right now. I mean, the world is kind of falling apart that this is something that's a little bit exciting. And I think even the biggest skeptics kind of want to believe. And there's an element of like excitement. There's an element of, well, all of this bad news, but we have this interesting, potential interesting UFO news coming out of the government. Maybe this will give us something exciting to focus on, something really fun that's new. You know, I think there's a little bit of that that's kind of driving a lot of the interest right now. Well, when you say news coming out of the government, let me follow up with Ralph on that, because I, I, I do want to get your sense about how cooperative the government and or the Pentagon truly is, how transparent they're truly being in helping the public understand what's going on right now. What's your sense of it? Well, they've had a bad history. Um, I mean, they've tamped this thing down from the very beginning, uh, probably fearing that the public couldn't handle it. Um, my feeling is that the public has been ahead of the government on this all along. And, uh, you know, when the government was attributing these uh, phenomena to, uh, you know, swamp gas or the planet Venus, um, people who knew what they had seen, people, often veterans of World War II, let's say, and, and they were looking at craft with uh, flashing lights and windows, and they got close-up views of, of these things, knew what they were looking at, and they, it was laughable what they thought, you know, what the government was trying to put over on them. So the people have been ahead of the government. The government has a long history of trying to downplay this for various reasons, some related to defense, et cetera. But, um, you know, I also wanted to say that uh, there's so many variables in the number of sightings. First of all, not everyone who who sees a UFO reports it. Um, secondly, it depends on places like California, which have which leads the country, the U.S. in sightings, uh, is probably because more people are outdoors there because of the weather. Uh, I did a story on this for the New York Times some years ago on a big thick book that tracked the, the sightings, the shape, uh, the time of day, the county. Um, uh, so there's a lot of data there. Uh, it's it's hard to parse, but um, there's, there's a lot of information. And my quarrel, by the way, with some of the so-called skeptics is that they have not done their homework. Um, they have a quick answer to everything, but they haven't looked through the, uh, you know, uh, tremendous amount of, of literature and reports and scientific reports that have come out on this issue. So if you're going to be a skeptic or a debunker, at least do the homework and, and look into it, which I did for my book. Hmm. Daniel, I wonder if I could get you to weigh in on, you know, we got liberals in power now in Ottawa, but five years ago it was, or six years ago, I guess now, it was conservatives in power. Uh, how well are either party in government in Canada doing at being transparent on this? Um, I think uh, opaque is a better word than uh, transparent. Um, I don't get the sense that, for example, the Canadian government is hiding anything per se, but I think um, when it comes to UFOs, there's been official disinterest for decades. Um, for example, you know, in the work I've done, it's incredibly difficult to get uh, responses from, you know, government and military officials for the stories I'm doing. Um, documents are a little bit easier to pull in Canada if you know what you're looking for, but we don't have any politicians who are outspoken on the UFO issue in Canada like they do in the United States. You know, for example, Florida Senator Marco Rubio has spoken uh, very openly and very frequently about the UFO issue. And this is a person who is on the uh, U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee, which would mean that, uh, you know, he's privy to a lot more material than people in the public like you and I are. Well, let me go to Amy on that. Yes, Marco Rubio, indeed, uh, former uh, not just a senator, but ran for the Republican nomination against Donald Trump. He's been public about his interest in this. Harry Reid, the former Senate Majority Leader for the Democrats, has shown a great deal of interest in this subject when he was in public life. What do you make of all that? That one, I feel, is a little bit hard to parse out. Um, politicians are always have some kind of angle, I feel, and I, I might, you know, this is just my own thoughts. <laughs> um, I feel like politicians always have an angle, whether it's bringing in money to their state or whether there's something that they personally want to see happen. Um, and I think when we talk about UFOs and kind of politicians being vocal about UFOs, the other thing we kind of need to remember is that the military has long denied having technology and having programs in existence and kept them from even senators and congresspeople 
because of classification. So the idea of people kind of calling for money to unload these programs or release these programs isn't necessarily new because there's always things that even the high ranking politicians don't necessarily know. But there could be some rationale. You know, these are all one thing, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing Navy sightings. We're not seeing a lot of Air Force and FAA sightings, which are kind of the two groups that are looking for things in the air. So is there is there another thing? Because at the end of the day, you know, whatever happens with this report, if there is an influx of money going into the Pentagon or to the military to study these phenomena, that money is very real, even if the sightings are turn out to not be, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, let me follow up with Ralph on that, because I, I think I remember reading in your story the fact that now, Harry Reid, the former Senate Majority Leader, is from Nevada, and he had a friend in Nevada who was interested in this subject, and therefore the Senate Majority Leader was helping to fund the work of his friend. Now, how much of that is what's really going on here, and how much of it is Harry Reid is really interested in UFOs? Well, let's name the friend. It's Robert Bigelow, who's an aerospace pioneer. He's got a module flying around with the International Space Station. Uh, he's a billionaire. Uh, he has funded uh, anomalous research in many ways, including a ranch in Utah that is uh, home to a lot of spooky phenomena, Skinwalker Ranch. So um, Bigelow, ha you know, has a legitimate interest in, in the subject and the resources to do that. Uh, he was picked as the as the subcon the contract the main contractor to do some of this research. But let me also say that um, the Navy now uh, is encouraging people and the Pentagon to come forward with stories, which they never did before. Now, that's something new, um, and that represents a break with the past, that they want um, military people to report these encounters um, for the first time. And um, uh, that shows, I think, a, a significant change in the posture of the Defense Department. Hmm. Chris, if there ever were a president who was going to blow the lid on this thing, I think it was, as Joe Biden describes him, the former guy. Uh, Don, you know, Donald Trump wasn't a big fan of following the typical procedures of government and and so on. In your view, did did he reveal any information about UFOs um, more than he should have or more than he might have wanted to? I don't think that uh, that Trump did, no. Um, and uh, in fact, I think there's been much more interest in what Barack Obama said. Uh, very recently about UFOs on, uh, I think it was on uh, uh, an American talk show. Uh, the political thing is is very interesting. I mean, in Canada, uh, there have been a number of politicians over the years who've gone on record about UFOs. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, in House of Commons debates, uh, UFOs have been brought up uh, more than 45 times, if you go through the Hansard. Uh, and uh, uh, former Governor General uh, Ed Schreier actually uh, challenged uh, the Royal Canadian Air Force a number of times on its position on UFOs, demanding to know uh, what's being done about it and so forth. So there are politicians uh, in Canada as well who are interested. I recently uh, uh, was uh, was interviewed with, uh, with Pamela Wallen. Uh, there's a few others that uh, have contacted me over the years. Um, and, you know, it's it's something that I think is, is uh, percolating in the back of everybody's mind. But... Uh, uh, you know, whether it's going to be revealed. I think a lot of people think this disclosure idea is going to be uh, telling everybody uh, what's really going on behind the scenes with regard to the government. I'm not entirely sure. I agree with, with Daniel that perhaps nothing is being done, really. But, you know, there are black projects that we don't have any privy information on. So uh, maybe even this particular intelligence report isn't going to get to the bottom of it. Daniel, let me get you to follow up on that in this regard. Uh, I mean, I've had conversations with a former cabinet minister named Paul Hellyer, who's a man, he's still around, he's in his late 90s now, I think, but he was defense uh, minister uh, back in the 60s. Uh, he represented the liberals and the conservatives, actually, in parliament. And he was absolutely convinced that UFOs exist. He went to, con he went to conferences on it, I recall, back in the day. Do you know any other politicians in Canada who've championed this issue? Well, one thing I should mention about uh, Mr. Hellyer, his interest in UFOs was developed after his time in office. Yes. So when he was uh, sitting as minister, he was, uh, you know, he's readily admitted this himself, that he was not engaged in this issue. Um, you know, I've had politicians in Canada um, quietly reach out to discuss the matter, 
but really there's in you know in parliaments right now in Ottawa right now there's doesn't seem to be anyone who's willing to be as outspoken on this topic as some of the politicians in the United States you know in addition to Rubio there's um, Senator Mark uh, Warner you know Obama has made comments John Podesta um, former CIA director John Brennan you know in the U.S. the list of prominent people who are speaking about this goes on and on you know right now here in Canada it's mostly silence. Hmm. Ralph, I Steve, think, sorry, somebody wanted to jump in there? This, yeah, I want to jump in because this may be counterintuitive, but, and it may sound crazy, but presidents don't necessarily know. Uh, they don't have a need to know. Uh, often they don't want to know. They have enough to deal with. Um, and from our research, we know that uh, the, the information is squirreled away in secret, you know, uh, parts of the government, uh, special access programs that require a very high degree of security clearance to get into. And even presidents uh, have not had uh, direct access uh, to these programs. If they insisted and wanted to know, we heard George H.W. Bush was one of those because he had a background at the CIA. But uh, since then, uh, I can't think of any president who has uh, you know, really probed into this area um, and, and gotten uh, either wanted to get answers or gotten any answers. So, you know, the, uh, you know, Popular conception might be if he's president, he can learn, he can know anything. That may be true, but in, in reality, they have not. Chris, uh, we are having, I think, a, a serious conversation about a serious subject uh, tonight among the five of us here. Uh, but the reality is, oftentimes in popular culture, uh, this issue is portrayed in, um, well, any number of different ways. And I see up there on the shelf behind you, you've got uh, the Martian from, um, oh my gosh, what cartoon was that from now? I'm blanking. Well, from Bugs Bunny. There's oh, from Bugs Bunny. There we go. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, and you've got, you know, movies, Independence Day, you've got the X-Files, you've got all sorts of things that, uh, that, you know, that certainly don't necessarily portray this issue in the most serious of fashions. Has that prevented agencies of government from ta and politicians from taking this issue more seriously? Well, there's no question it has. The reality is that uh, the concept of UFOs and aliens has been very pervasive in our culture for, for many years. We live in the James Cameron universe where we assume aliens are out there. Um, and But that actually also drives scientists to pursue the subject of uh, aliens and UFOs. In fact, I, I have many colleagues in, in physics and astronomy who uh, uh, have gotten into the subject because they're, they're curious about the possibility of life out there. Um, and there's many master's and doctoral theses that are published uh, uh, every year on the subject of UFOs and aliens uh, across North America and around the world. So science is taking the, uh, the subject seriously. Uh, it's just that, uh, you know, our popular culture presents it in a way that, that is less so. So I think we have to acknowledge that, but at the same time recognize that there is seriousness. And whether it's aliens or you know, foreign powers sending uh, uh, incursions into our airspace or perhaps... Uh, you know, some technical difficulties with radar and, and infrared sensors and that type of thing. In any of those situations, I think it's definitely worthwhile pursuing. And I think uh, hopefully this congressional investigation or through the Senate Intelligence uh, Report will spur some of that. Uh, down to our last few minutes here. And Amy, let me get you to weigh in on this. What if, what if there's actually conclusive proof that UFOs exist, that they're not unidentified anymore? They are genuinely aliens. Okay, then what? awesome. <laughs> um, I think that would be a very interesting thing to come of it. Um, not sure that's what we're going to get from this report, but I think it would be really, really interesting. And I think, um, you know, the, the, the science mind in me is just like, great, cool. Let's understand that. Now it's no longer unidentified. Now we get to identify it and learn about it, which can never be a problem. So I think, I think if we do kind of get anything conclusive out of this report, and even if there, you know, the, what we get out of this report is just kind of a central database of all of the sightings from across the, the military and civilian reports to kind of have this, this database to where like we can go to things and we can match, match up sightings and actually try to understand it and get a better understanding of what people are seeing in the sky. I think that's also a great thing to come of it. I think um, no matter what, what happens, it could probably be a good thing for the sake of studying what we do see in the sky. Daniel, if we're not the only ones out there, okay, then what? Honestly, to me, you know, I feel like when we start talking about uh, aliens and ET, it sort of detracts from this conversation. Um, you know, the stories I write deal with credible observers like military personnel and professional aviators who have genuinely been seeing weird things in our skies 
for decades. Um, and all of those could have conventional explanations. Um, I'm perfectly willing to admit that. But as a society, you know, when people make reports of this nature, we've sort of ridiculed them or dismissed them. But we need more people like this to come forward. And the only way we're able, we're going to be able to do that is by, you know, normalizing the conversation, which will hopefully lead to, you know, more and better data from witnesses, which could hopefully lead to answers. And if it's all conventional in the end, if it's all prosaic, I think that's just fine. Um, but what we really need to do is take it seriously and as a society accept that, you know, these observations are real. And the only way we're going to get answers is if we take it seriously and study it. Ralph, in our last minute, sum it up for us. If the truth is out there, then what? Look, we can't get ahead of ourselves. Um, we cannot equate UFOs and aliens. And uh, the government has been very clear on this, that they are looking into, you know, what these objects are, their aerodynamics, trying to duplicate it, if it can be duplicated for ourselves, um, and keep it away from our adversaries. But no one in the government is talking about aliens. And in our reporting in the New York Times, we've been very careful, you know, not to draw that uh, inference that these things are operated by aliens. We just don't know. So it's, it's very important to keep that separate. Um, there are people who've had experiences, but what, how they're related to UFOs, we don't know. So let's keep our eye on the ball. Let's try to figure out what these things are, um, gather all the data, as we said, let's, let science take a good look, um, and then take it from there one step at a time. That's Ralph Blumenthal, along with Amy Shira Title, Chris Rutkowski, and Daniel Otis. Great of all of you to spend so much time with us on TVO tonight discussing this. We're really grateful. Take care, everybody. Twenty-four hours a day, 365 days a year, cab drivers weave their way through city streets there at the wave of a hand to take you home or out or wherever. And their stories are as different and fascinating as the routes they take. Writer Marcello Di Cintio details some of them in his new book. It's called Driven, The Secret Lives of Taxi Drivers. And Marcello Di Cintio joins us now from Calgary, Alberta on that. Buonasera, come va? <laughs> Hello, how are you? I'm so, just terrific, so thank you. I love, I have to confess, I love saying your name. Your name is so poetic, it's just great. <laughs> I love hearing you say my name. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, <laughs> look, at, I love this book. This was terrific. And oh, uh, it, it, it makes taking a cab, um, you know, it gives you a whole lot to think about the next time you hop into a taxi. But the first line of your book is so fascinating. Your first line is, I hate taking taxis. So how did you go from hating taking taxis to spending so much time writing a book about them with, frankly, such considerable affection and interest? Well, I guess I, I, I should say, I, I mean, yeah, I hate taking taxis. You know, my, my, my uh, all the other books that I've written are travel books. I travel uh, you know, far afield to Africa, the Middle East. And uh, in those kinds of traveling, your taxi driver is al almost always your a nemesis, right? These are places where the, the meters don't work or don't exist. And so every, the end of every trip is, like a, is a negotiation, often a heated one, over the fare. And so spending so much time in traveling those parts of the world or having to deal with those, those arguments all the time, I kind of have this, I call it the post-taxi stress disorder. So every time I get into a cab, I feel this, this like Pavlovian anxiety. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I don't have a huge affection for, for driving cab. But, you know, I, I started to wonder what I was missing on my, on my trips to and from the airport in the cab, in, in the taxis to go on these, on these long trips abroad. You know, what were, the, what were the stories that I wasn't getting that were just in the seat right in front of me, right? You know, who, who, who were behind the eyes I could see in the rearview mirror? So I decided that for a buddy, I, think was, I spent a little more than a year. And instead of leaving Canada like I normally do, I spent uh, the time traveling around this country, meeting with drivers and, and getting their life stories, getting to hear their, their, their personal narratives. And uh, I found some amazing, amazing stories. Yes, you did. But what did you think you were missing out on that you hadn't even considered, despite all those taxi rides that you were taking that prompted you to write the book about them? I was, I'm, I was missing everything. I'm sure like most people, I get into the back of a, a back of a cab, I blurt out my destination, and then I stare at my phone for the entire journey, right? You know, there's, the, the taxi is such a unique and strange place if you think about it. You know, where else are you in, in such close proximity with a stranger for so long 
and engage is, is so little, right? You know, there, there's 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 very little engagement that happens between the driver and the passenger. And I mean, it's 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 true that most of the drivers in in Canada come from come from somewhere else. You know, I didn't need to travel outside of my borders to to hear amazing stories uh, uh, from from faraway places. Th those stories exist all around us. Well, let's go back because the taxi industry does go a long way back in Canada. Maybe um, I don't know. Give us a few details here. How far back does it go? What I, the history that I found was the first uh, first taxi company in Upper Canada uh, um, was uh, founded in 1837 by a, a, a couple from Kentucky, uh, Lucy and Thornton Blackburn. Now, <laughs> I imagine if you're if you're in Upper Canada, if you're in Toronto at the time, you get into this horse-drawn cab, you blurt out your destination just as we do here, and instead of looking at the cell phone, maybe you look at the you look at the, the day's newspaper. Um, and you don't pay much attention to, to who it is that's driving this, driving this cab, whose hands are on the reins. But Lucy and Thornton had an incredible story. They were slaves in Kentucky, escaped slavery, crossed the Ohio River, and made it to Detroit, where they lived for two years before being recaptured. Both of them escaped prison and crossed the border into Canada. And their former owners uh, sued Canada for extradition. You know, they, this was their property they wanted back. And Canada refused. And the Blackburn case was one of the precedents that, that started the, um, the Underground Railroad in motion. And so, and so imagine sitting in this taxi, you know, with, with Thornton on the roof, you know, with his hands on the reins, uh, um, and, and realize, not realizing this, this incredible life story of, 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 of the man driving you around. And that's exactly the sort of thing I was looking for too. I wanted to know where these men and some women came from. What 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 were their childhoods like? What 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 did they do before, you know, ending up in the in the driver's seat? That's that was my main focus. I was I was less interested in taxi driving than the taxi drivers. And at what point did it become a pretty good way to make a living in this country? Ah, oh, it's interesting. I, <laughs> I think I think uh, 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 the, the taxi industry has always been a place where uh, uh, people who um, they could, it, it's it's work that was relatively e relatively easy to find. Um, it was it allowed you to be independent. It allowed you to work late nights if you wanted to, or during the days if you wanted to. A lot of the cabbies that I met, um, you know, none of them ever intended to, to to drive cab. In fact, one of them said to me, "No mother ever gave birth to a taxi driver." And um, and and so it, it ended up for a lot of these a lot of these yeah, again mostly men uh, uh, an industry of default and it's always been that way um, you know it's kind of like lost souls ended up behind the cab they found these wonderful old um, uh, uh, decades old kind of uh, studies of, of cab drivers and and there was a lot of a lot of people who were kind of kind of society's lost folks um, in the eighties uh, it stopped it became uh, the the 70s and 80s, it became a place where new Canadians could find work. Um, you know, a, a new Canadian who comes and, and, and has made perhaps his or her credentials are not recognized by, by Canada, um, they can find work driving cab. If they know how to drive, they can, they can find work driving cab. And it allows them to maybe be in school on their off driving hours. It allows them to be flexible with their, with their children and, 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 and other, other jobs, you know, often working two or three different jobs. So it, 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 it used to be a much more flexible and lucrative job than it is now. I mean, we can talk about that if you like, but uh, uh, back in the day, it, it, was, it, was, it was a reliable source of income for new Canadians. Well, you've partially answered this question, but, but, but I don't think entirely because I know when I was a kid, Marcello, every cab you got into was driven by somebody who was born in Canada. Now, when you get into a cab, I'm not sure there are any taxis that are driven by somebody who's been born in Canada. It, it, it sounds like you're saying it was the 1980s where that changed. And and why did it change? The immigration policies changed in in, in Canada. Uh, um, it was it was a uh, immigration policies changed in Canada, and also uh, world events led to it. You know, wars in the Middle East and and and, and Africa, coups. You know, these sorts of things that that people were people fled danger in their in their homelands and ended up ended up in Canada. Uh, uh, sometimes as refugees, sometimes as, as regular immigrants. Um, but that that's that's when that that's when that shift started to happen. But you're right. I, the The majority of cab drivers in Canada are born elsewhere, especially in the in the major cities. I think it's sometimes eighty percent of uh, 
of, of drivers in big cities are, are, are somewhere around there are, are, from, are from somewhere else. And I think like you, every time I get into a cab, I actually don't stick my nose into my phone. I do like to engage with the driver because it's true. They've all got amazing backstories. And, and, and you have, I mean, you've nailed it in this book, people who come out of war zones, who come out of oppressive regimes. And I just want to talk to you about some of the examples you give. Mohammed sure. Mo Abdul Jalil. What's his story? You know, as a writer, you're not supposed to have favorites, I think. But Mo Jalil was one of my favorite uh, drivers that I got to meet uh, when writing this book. Mo was a wrestler and a soldier in Iraq. He fought two wars for Saddam Hussein um, before, uh, and also served time in, a, in an Iraqi prison uh, for, for assaulting a superior officer uh, before he decided he wanted to be an artist of all things. Now you imagine, you know, uh, Mo is this big bruising Iraqi guy and he, and he wanted to be an artist. And he eventually ended up in Halifax where he went to art school. It didn't go well for him. Um, but also, Mo suffers from uh, uh, a tremendous PTSD from his time in, on the battlefields uh, uh, in Iraq, and and he brought you know he brought that with him too. So he's he's a guy who's who's big and boastful. He, he refers to himself as kind of a peacock. Um, at the same time, he's he's a damaged guy, and, and you know, I don't think I've met another human being, much less another you know driver in this book, who so has such self awareness about his own failings and his own. Uh, mistakes that he's made in his life. You know, he, here's a guy who's been through a lot. Here's a guy who's, you know, endured violence, and here's a guy who's propagated violence, and uh, and and is incredibly open about it. And he, he's warm at times. He's you know bristly at other times, and he's lived an the kind of incredible multi-layered life that was just a, you know a joy to to be able to to hear about. I I, I loved my, the time I spent with Mo and Halifax. One of the other drivers you profiled went on to become a prominent novelist, and uh, I hope I'm saying the name correctly, Rawi Hage, is that how you say it? Rawi Hodge. Hodge. Tell us about Rawi. Yeah, Rawi, Rawi grew up in, in Civil War Beirut, uh, uh, finally left the, 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 the violence uh, and, and war and chaos when he was 19 years old. Um, when that, when that uh, explosion happened in Beirut last year, it wiped out what used to be his neighborhood. Um, he ended up in the States for a little while, and then in, in Canada. Uh, he wanted to be a photographer. He wanted to be a, um, a, like a, an arts, a fine arts photographer. And he decided to get his MFA. And he felt that the, the only way he could, he could afford his MFA uh, was to, to find a job that allowed him to go to school during the day and work at night. And, and, the, and the taxi industry in Montreal was perfect for him. So he, he started to drive cab in Montreal, and he, he admits he was, a, he was a lousy cab driver. He had poor night vision, and he had a terrible sense of direction. Uh, uh, but nonetheless, he, he drove cab in Montreal. And while he was driving cab, he wrote his first novel. And uh, it became it won the Impact Dublin Prize, it, it, it the, the largest literary prize in the world. And he wrote that book while driving cab. And in fact, when the book first came out, he tried selling copies to his passengers. And uh, he was not a very good, if he wasn't a very good driver, he wasn't a very good salesman either. But it turns out Rawi didn't need to be. He's one of Canada's most celebrated authors. Um, and his story is unique in the book because the interesting part of, of Rawi's story is how he stopped driving cab, like what happened afterwards. And for the, the, the bulk of the drivers in my book, it's who they were before, you know, what, 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 was their, what were their lives before they ended up behind the wheel? Mm -hmm. Now, I want to circle back to something you said a few moments ago, and that is you described the profession as mostly male, but some female. And, and the fact of the matter is it's almost entirely male and very, I mean, I, I can't remember the last time I got into a cab and I saw that there was a woman behind the wheel. Why is this profession so male? Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot, lots of reasons for that. I mean, I mean, it's something that when, whenever women are in the uh, in the business, uh, and and there was I found a great story about about a group of women in Paris, you know, World War One era Paris, who started driving cab, and they were they were a sensation. It was a novelty that these that these women were 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 driving taxis. Um, I think there's obviously taxi driving is 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 a dangerous profession, uh, uh, and and especially especially for women, especially driving at night. Um, and it, it's, it's always been this kind of, this kind of male preserve of, of work. Yeah, ex exceptionally few women drive. I talked to the manager of Beck Taxi, which is the largest taxi company in Toronto and probably the largest in North America. And the manager said that she can only recall 
something like 15 women ever working for Beck. And so, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's always been kind of a, a, a male job. And yet you did profile this ride service that particularly specializes for indigenous women. I think it's called Equisafe mm -hmm. Rides. It's in Winnipeg. What's the background behind that, why that started up? Well, you know, in my book, almost all the drivers that I met are kind of the heroes of the stories, all the taxi drivers I met. Not so much in Winnipeg. In Winnipeg, tax, the regular traditional taxi drivers have a, have a terrible reputation uh, for treating women, particularly indigenous women, poorly uh, uh, in, in, in the taxis. So uh, a, a group of women decided to, to counter this, this problem. They started their own ride service called Ikwe Safe Rise. And what it is, is, is uh, women who have a vehicle and have some time to volunteer offer to be drivers and they drive only other women around. And so uh, other, Winnipeg, other, other women in Winnipeg can sign up to be part of this, this community really of, of, of drivers and passengers. And so when they need a, when they need a ride, they, they post it on this dedicated Facebook page. And if a volunteer is available, they respond and they, and they drive them around. It's, it's, it's a, it's the, it's a charity, I suppose. It's it's don't the passengers will give a donation to the driver, but it was able to kind of circumvent what was going on with with the regular industry. Now I should be let me be clear, I was not I I, I reached out to Winnipeg's taxi drivers to ask them about about Ikwe and and about their reputation, and they there no one would speak to me. Um, so I, I want to make sure that it's clear that you know I I did I did do my best to talk to those drivers, but they 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 didn't want to talk to me. Um, but instead, what's happened is this um, this really wonderful community is formed between women in Winnipeg, hundreds of them, uh, uh, who drivers and passengers who get, who got to know each other, friendships are, are developed, there's relationships between everybody. It's really quite a beautiful thing. I have to say, you are nothing if not blunt about some of the stuff that takes place in the back of a taxi cab. And a lot of it is sex, and a lot of it is gross, and you don't spare us a lot of the details. Now, let's talk about there's a story about a woman named Tammy Marie. And, you know, on the one hand, um, on the one hand, it is a sad and tragic tale. On the other hand, her efforts to get her life together are really quite inspiring at a certain point. Tell us her story, if you would. Sure. If, if, if I may I just step back a little bit, you know, there is there is this kind of cliche of the, what I call a taxi noir about these the, the, the kind of sex, drugs and misbehavior in the backseat of a cab. Right. And, and, and when I was talking to the drivers, a lot of them thought that's what I, those are the stories I wanted to hear. And for the most part, I did not You know, I really I really feel that those are the kinds of stories that are pervasive in, in our pop culture already. And I was really looking at, at the at more of the backgrounds and the life stories of, of, of these drivers more than that. However, Tammy, Tammy Marie. Uh, Tammy Marie was a sex worker in Calgary, uh, and she was a street level worker, and she was a drug addict. And uh, you know, if if the if she talked to me about how for her whole life, her whole career as a sex worker, um, taxi drivers were her guardian angels. Uh, they were they were the ones that that kind of occupied the same nocturnal environment that she did. They were the ones that she could trust to take her away from, from terrible situations. Uh, um, and so she had this remarkable relationship with the drivers. One in particular, this gentleman named Sam, who she never got to know his last name. And she was kind of one of, it, he was her reliable driver for several years. And, you know, when, when she started to, when she started to switch from, you know, softer to harder drugs and then even harder drugs, it was Sam who, who convinced her that she needed help. And it was Sam who picked her up from her recovery center when she, on, on her weekends, you know, b between recovery. And he, you know, he may have saved her life. Well, it was also Sam though, if I remember this correctly, uh, upon whom she was performing sexual services, even though she was a minor at the time. So how do we square that yes. circle? I don't. Uh, um, I, I, you know, and I, and I asked Tammy about that. You know, yes, you know, the, here, here's a man who you, who, who's a, who's a grown man, uh, an adult. You were a teenager. Uh, he was, he was your guardian angel, as you say. At the same time, he was paying for sex with a minor, and, and, uh, and she said to me, she does not see that as exploitation. And, and I guess we have to see Tammy's world from her own eyes, where, uh, uh, in, in, in the environment where she operated, or the environment where she worked. The, so many there was so many other dangers of, of exploitation and abuse from from police officers often from 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 her clients that this this 
con con consensual relationship between her and their driver to her did not seem like exploitation. Now, of course, the law disagrees, um, but from her point of view, uh, uh, Sam was Sam was a hero for her. Okay. Um, I, I do want you to tell us about how dangerous a profession this can be. And you do have one story in the book about a cab driver who really, oh my goodness. I mean, uh, well, uh, okay, you tell the story. I won't spoil it, but he really went, he's been through the ringer, this poor guy. Alex in Edmonton. Yes, Alex, again, another great story. A Alex and his family escaped from Czechoslovakia in a, in a battered Skoda, ended up in a refugee camp before getting to Edmonton. And, and, and Alex is... <laughs> get rich slow scheme was to train his daughter eva to become a like a, a championship tennis player that's why we thought he was going to make like, his, his fortune that didn't work out quite well um but in fact he was uh, he was estranged from eva for for many many years until uh, a few years back alex was, was driving someone in his cab uh the gentleman alex describes it as he, he saw a flash of metal and 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 quickly like dodged it and it was the, the gentleman in the back seat had pulled a hunting knife out of his bag and was trying to stab alex in the neck and uh uh what ended up happening was was this was this fight inside of the cab between this this man with a knife and alex who, who took who took uh, uh wounds to his ribs and to right underneath his right underneath his chin he came close to getting it slashing his throat um but what the assailant didn't realize before he attacked Alex is that Alex has like a black belt in this obscure karate style and and was actually trained in how to disarm an assailant and and so while this guy's trying to stab Alex Alex is headbutting him and kicking him and ends up ends up kind of subduing this guy uh uh, uh from you know who jumped in the back jumped into the front seat um and eventually the kind of this crowd of people gathered around and they separated them out and Alex uh, um, was brought to the, we were brought to the hospital and sewed up the, the, the wounds in his, on his hands and his neck and his ribs. Um, uh, the, the, the assailant actually almost bit, like it was, it had teeth, uh, bite marks all, like bite marks all on, on Alex's arm. Um, but, but, but he survived. And, and uh, that was part of the reason, I'm not gonna say it was the whole reason, part of the reason he, him and his, his long estranged daughter, uh, Kind of reconciled. It was like she, when she when I talked to her, she said, "Yeah, I almost lost my dad," and uh, she didn't want to be away from him anymore. And and this this very close to death experience uh, that that Alex uh, suffered um, kind of brought his family together again. Do you know if he's still driving? Oh, uh, good question. I don't know if he's still driving. Last time I checked, he was still driving. He doesn't play tennis much anymore. Uh, uh, there was a. The, 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 he got a knife wound in the hand that made his his uh, racket grip uh, a weaker. So he, um, he's a guy who used, he used to win uh, medals internationally in kind of senior or like masters tennis tournaments. And I, I'm not sure how much tennis he plays now. But he's the ha <laughs> in spite of everything this guy's gone through. You will not meet a more charming, happy, vivacious human being on, on, on the planet. It was funny that the when the Edmonton Journal reported on his assault, they called him an elderly cab driver. You would never, if you ever met Alex, you would not consider him an elderly anything, even though he's nearly 70. That, you know, that guy's a gazelle. <laughs> Let me ask you about danger of another kind. And that is, you know, as the pandemic was taking hold, mm. there no doubt were people who were COVID-19 hopping into taxis and infecting drivers who were not wearing, you yeah. know, at the time we weren't wearing masks. We didn't know to wear masks. Uh, what can you tell us about the impact COVID-19 has had on this profession? Yeah, it was interesting. You know, my, this book was finished before the pandemic. Uh, started. And so I had to actually went back and added a, like, I called it my pandemic postscript, where I went back and talked to the drivers who I previously interviewed and, and find out kind of how they're, how they were, how things were going for them during COVID and <laughs> not well. Um, yes, absolutely. The, the, you know, you think about the close proximity of, of strangers, you know, in, in a taxi cab that, 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 that exaggerates the danger of, 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 of what, what, what can happen. Um, I don't think they know the numbers for sure, but at least a dozen Canadian taxi drivers have died from COVID, and and who knows how many uh, have been infected. Um, some of the some of the companies have done their best to to put screens you know between the front and back seats if they didn't exist before. I talked to a driver in Cranbrook, and his his taxi manager um, hung you know uh, uh, shower curtains that he, they'd bought at the local Canadian Tire or Home Depot between the front and back seats as as some sort of preventative measure. But but these 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 drivers they're putting themselves at considerable risk, right? Not only not only are they 
in this close contact in an enclosed space with strangers, they're also driving people to and from their, their testing sites. They're driving to people to and from their, their uh, uh, doctor's appointments. And let's face it, the people who are, who are breaking the, the rules and are doing these indoor gatherings and having house parties, when they're done, you know, they're, when they're done their parties, then they're done maybe passing COVID all around, the, all around that group, they call a cab to take them home. So, so the drivers are at the, at the front line of, 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 of the worst kinds of behavior uh, during the past year. You know, and I think, I think we need to realize in this country that what, I think we really need to realize that, that, that from the very beginning, the drivers have been there for us. You know, we, we didn't bang our pots for the drivers last spring, right? And maybe we should have, and maybe we should, we should realize the risks that they've, that they've, that they've taken to, to continue doing their jobs. Marcello, in our last minute here, I just wonder whether or not you've heard back from any of the people that you've chronicled and whether or not they are pleased or concerned or what about the fact that uh, you have told their stories the way you've told them. I've heard of, I heard from, from quite a few and, and, and most of them are very pleased. Um, no, I mean, all of them have gotten back to me who are very pleased. Um, uh, and I was most worried, we talked about Mo earlier, so we'll, we can end with Mo. I was a little bit worried about Mo because like I mentioned, Mo is this <laughs> Mo contains multitudes, you know, he, he's this kind and gentle guy, but he's also a, kind of a beast and kind of, you know, you know, he's got this arrogance. And I really wanted to, to paint a picture of Mo that was, that, that, that kind of captured all those layers to him. And I was not sure he would like it or not, but oh my goodness, Mo was, <laughs> Mo was thrilled. And, uh, and, uh, and, and he, he seemed like he quite enjoyed kind of, the, you know, the, the, the warts and all portrayal that, that I, that I, I had with him in the book. Um, you know, I don't, I don't write books to make friends with my sources. Uh, at the same time, I would hate if they felt that they were, they're misrepresented. And, and, and it seems like the drivers that I did write about who have gotten back to me have, have, have enjoyed their portrayals. Well, I sure did. This was a great book to read. Driven, The Secret Lives of Drivers, Taxi Drivers, Marcello Di Cintio. Uh, well done, and we're so grateful you spared some time for us on TVO tonight. Thank you. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, June 16th, 2021. Tomorrow, economist Mariana Mazzucato explains why capitalism needs an overhaul and why governments must help lead the way. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.